Well, howdy, everybody, and welcome to our latest Sierra Forum. I'm Jason Mark. I'm the editor-in-chief of Sierra Magazine, and I host these regular gatherings, which is a chance for you, Sierra Club members and supporters and activists, to learn directly from our staff and from our allies and partners about the work that we're doing to protect clean air, clean water, a stable climate, and wildlands and wildlife. Do acknowledgement and say that I'm speaking to you today from the traditional homelands of the Wichin Ohlone people. Today we'll do about 20 to 30 minutes of discussion with our panelists. We'll leave plenty of time for Q&A. If you've got a question, you're joining us from Zoom, you can just put your question right there in the Q&A box. And if you're joining us from Facebook, please post them in the comments and those will get forwarded to us. Well, today, as you might know, we're talking about the fate of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. In 1960, President I protected nearly 9 million acres across Northern Alaska as the Arctic National Wildlife Range to be expanded and renamed a national refuge. But when oil deposits were discovered on the range's north slope to the west of the protected prairie, the fight over oil drilling in the refuge began, and it continued for decades. The refuge has been on the verge of drilling and at other times on the edge of more meaningful, lasting protection for decades until 2017, when President Trump signed a major tax bill with a largely overlooked rider. And now, after almost 50 years of passionate debate, U.S. law allows oil leasing on the Arctic prairie. We'll be today to talk about that place, to tell us what's at stake, and to give us the update on this. We've got an all of folks working to protect the refuge. Bernadette Demetrov is the executive director of the steering committee from Sierra Club, Ali Har. Uh, she's the uh, uh, senior campaign representative. Palmer Alaska. We've got Hill, who's the Associate Director of Lands and Water, Land, Water and Water Campaign here at the Sierra Club. Uh, Bernadette and Allie and uh, Chris, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, Bernadette, I'd, I'd like to start with you and have you tell folks and share with people um, a little bit more about this place, um, what it's like, what the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge and the glitch in traditional lands are like and, and why they're so culturally important um, in your community. Thank you for having Bernadette Dementiev, Kuchajakotsanhiti. My name is Bernadette Dementiev and I'm from Fort Eugene, Alaska. Um, at the very first gin gathering that was held in over 150 years, that was in 1988 in Arctic Village. And our elders and chiefs gathered because of the threat to the 1002 area, which you guys, you know, the 1002 to us is called Bondai Godlit, the sacred place where life begins. No one to the rest of the world, it's called the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. So if you look at the migratory route of the porcupine caribou herd and the Gwich'in communities, they're identical. So for over 40,000 years, we migrated with the caribou, but we would always fall short from going into their calving grounds. Um, and so our leaders and uh, our chiefs, um, directed by um, two very respected elders, um, in 88 they gathered. And so we still follow that direction today. Um, you know, this is not only a food security issue, this is an identity crisis. And, um, you know, we want our homelands protected. We want our um, animals and our identity protected, our human rights respected. And so, um, you know, on the caribou, everything we use, um, we use for tools, for clothing and for food and nothing goes to waste. And that's how we still practice our traditional ways of life today, is we take what we need. Um, I know that there's a lot of people that don't understand that, you know, we're not asking for anything. We're not asking for hospitals. We're not asking for schools or jobs. We just want to keep our identity as Gwich'in people. We know there's an ever-changing world. Um, but we still, you know, we, our ways of life is hard, but it's, um, it's one that we want to keep. Um, it's very special to us. And so, um, you know, with the climate changing right now um, and the government 
it, we feel very attacked, not only by climate change, but by a government that is supposed to honor our human rights. So, you know, I got to say, uh, the 15 communities that we present, I see a lot of anxiety and frustration. Um, they don't understand why people are coming into our homelands, making decisions about our future and involving us. So um, really it does mean a lot. You guys are standing with us. And it gets emotional. It, this is like we're fighting for our like we're our survival and it gets really emotional and i don't want to let my people down but you know we're kind of backed into a corner right now and we need all the help that we can get we need our story out there and um we uh, let this government know that they have to respect our human rights as which in people so i really thank you so much for having um this video and just inviting me and just for always sharing our stories thank you well thank you bernadette um for that that really moving and powerful testimonial um and thank you for all of your leadership on this issue i, I just want to make one quick clarification of my land acknowledgement i said the we chin uh ohlone people some people might have misunderstand that it is which and it's we chin alone east bay of san francisco um uh, Chris, I'd, I'd love to hear from you about um, what the latest moves are from the Trump administration, what we've seen in recent weeks and months, um, and also what's happening there on Capitol Hill to reverse this attack and the, um, uh, the proposed drilling on the Arctic plain. Sure. Thanks, Jason. And thank you, Bernadette, for coming on and talking with us and sharing your story and the story of your people as well. I really do appreciate it. Um, and anyways, uh, my name is the DC office of the Sierra Club, and I work with Allie and Bernadette on this campaign. And uh, it is it is truly an honor to work on this with these with these two women. So to back up a little little bit here, Jason, as you mentioned, how we got into this mess. So. Just to back up, in December of 2017, industry and Republicans in Congress um, got what they wanted, right? And so within this tax bill that passed, there was a provision that allowed for the opening up of um, drilling in the coastal plain of the Arctic Refuge. Fast forward a couple of months, um, we have really seen the administration go full force and really go strong in trying to figure out how do they get in there, how does industry get in there, and how do they start drilling um, on the coastal plain. And so that's where we are right now. Our longstanding goal Sierra Club for this work and for the Arctic Refuge campaign is permanent protection, right? And that's either through the administrative process or through the legislative process. That's obviously a long-term and that's going to take years to make. Right now, in 2019, our main goal is to delay, delay, delay. Delay the process of getting, of having seismic testing in um, the Arctic Refuge, which Ali is going to talk about a bit later. Delay the lease sales that could potentially be happening this summer. And while doing all of that, uplifting the voices of the Gwich'in, centering the voices of the Gwich'in, and also showing this out cry of support for the Arctic Refuge by setting the stage for future for future protection in the next couple of years. So the one strategy that we're really working on is um, more of the Hills Champs, the legislative strategy. And what that looks like is engaging our Hill Champs, elevating, continuing to elevate this issue on the Hill um, by really laying that groundwork now for the next couple of years, right? And it's an, also another way that we can signal to industry that this is not popular, right? And nobody wants this. Um, and so what that looks like is uh, through a bill, and it's a really awesome bill that Representative Huffman out of California introduced in early February. It is HR 1146, and it's called the Arctic Cultural and Coastal Plain Protection Act, which we say is the Restore Protection Act. 
as I said, this was introduced in February of this year. It currently has about 124 co-sponsors. So it has significant um, groundswell of support on the health side. Um, and it's a really awesome in that it restores the uh, protections of the coastal plain of the Arctic Life Refuge by repealing the provision in that 2017 tax bill that I talked about. So um, that right now is that they're doing um, a couple of uh, in that Bernadette may talk about a little bit later. There was a really wonderful hearing on that. They will soon be voting in committee and then that that bill will go to the floor for a vote. So what we see right now is a really significant time in our campaign to really bring up the grassroots uh, support and the constituency support for this bill. So one of the things that we are focusing on is getting more co-sponsors for the bill to show the amount of support in the house that this bill has and then also to make sure that it passes out of committee and out of the floor and in doing so this shows for future administrations and for future um, congresses that this is an important issue and people don't want drilling on the coastal plain so that's sort of where we are on the hill side um, the one thing that i do want to mention jason is that um, for folks who want to figure out how can they act what are in their um, state, in their district, there is a two-week congressional recess that's happening. So all of our um, congressional representatives will be back in district period. That's a great time to go visit your person and say, sign on to this. Have you co-sponsored this bill? If not, go. So there's a lot of in your district for this. That's one of the things. Um, there's also love for folks to call their congressional office like on the hill up here in DC you can call show um, say your support for the bill ask them to co-sponsor if they haven't and definitely ask them to vote yes for this bill once it comes to the full floor Chris thank you so much for that that update and it's really great to hear that encouraging news out of Washington DC and the momentum building to, to reverse that provision in the 2017 tax bill. And, we, and I do want to come back to you in a minute, Bernadette, uh, to talk about your experience in DC last month. But before we do that, Ali, I'd love to hear from you also what's happening on um, the corporate side. So I know that we had a, an oil and gas exploration company, SAE um, Exploration, which was trying to go there and do seismic testing this winter. I'd love to hear an update about that, as well as the work that the Sierra Club and others are doing um, to target the financiers, the major banks and investment companies um, that may or may not be interested in funding oil exploration and extraction there in the Arctic Refuge. Great, thank you, Jason. And I just gotta echo what Chris said, when I look around this room and also when I know how much support is really out there helping us with this work, it's just, it's so motivating and incredible to me and it's such an honor to get to partner with the Gwich'in Steering Committee and to work with Bernadette and with this awesome team at the Sierra Club. So thank you for this opportunity and thank you to everybody who's here. So um, yeah, let's talk about the corporate work. Just to give some broader context, going back to our delay, delay, delay strategy, we know that it's important for all of the reasons that Chris laid out to be working the administrative process as hard as we can, to have the millions of people who have showed up and commented formally to this administration that they're opposed to drilling do that we know it's important to elevate for our champs on the hill because ultimately we want to pass long-term legislation but in this new landscape and with trump in office and with the gridlock in congress we also know how critical it is for us to innovate and what we have collectively seen throughout the past several years is that in absence of meaningful leadership from some of our elected officials many corporations and finance are actually stepping up to the plate to say we are going to take a stand because we know that the social aspect of what we do is critical to our bottom line. And so Sierra Club in partnership with the Gwich'in and with many other partners has been really leading this charge to form the new corporate facing aspect of the Arctic Refuge campaign, which is a really exciting landscape and as I'm about to describe, it's already paying off. 
So what I want to describe to you and share are a couple of things. First, I want to share one anecdote from an oil company meeting that uh, the Sierra Club was at last year. We attended Chevron's annual general meeting in California and you know, shared with their shareholders why we are opposed to drilling in the coastal plain. And just for anybody who's ever commented and wondered, you know, I'm commenting to this, this administration, is it actually going anywhere? We heard from Chevron's board that they are monitoring this administrative process really carefully to see what the public reaction is, which is something that they perceive as risk, right? And so it's really important to their bottom line. And so that was a really interesting cue for us and I think helpful for everybody out there to know that the oil companies are really closely watching this administrative process to gauge how risky of a bet it would be for them to bid on leases and actually drill on the coastal plain. So wanted to share that with folks. And I want to lay out for you, you know, what we did, again, in partnership with the Gwich'in, to target, as Jason said, that one exploration company that put in a permit application to conduct seismic testing in the coastal plain. This whole thing has been incredibly rushed. This company applied to conduct seismic testing starting in the 2018-19 seismic season. There needs to be a snow cover in the coastal plain for them to conduct the testing. It was an extremely aggressive permit. They would cover every square acre of the coastal plain, go through with the things called thumper trucks that basically drive a really tight grid across the entire plain and have plates on the bottom which deliver 64,000 pounds of force per thump and go through in this way, basically mapping the geological resources under the coastal plain and then provide and sell that data to the companies that might be interested in bidding. They had a really aggressive schedule. They wanted to start in early December. And again, we looked at the landscape of what we needed to do. Our legal team was really savvy in bringing on um, and working with a supporting a polar bear expert to talk about the real risks and of harm to mother and baby polar bears who use the, the coastal plain for denning. Um, and our team saw this opportunity through our corporate campaigning to target this company, SA Exploration, and say, you need to meet with the Gwich'in and you need to not do seismic testing in the coastal plain. And we collectively were able to send over 300,000 letters to SA Exploration's top executives outlining these risks and making this ask. And then in the early part of this year, <laughs> the Gwich'in and partners went all the way down to Houston, Texas to deliver 100,000 of these letters in person at their corporate offices and again, asked for that meeting. SA Exploration did not reply to that meeting and yet they were forced to concede towards the end of seismic season that they had run out of time and that they could not proceed with seismic this year, which is a major, major benchmark victory under our strategy of delay, 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 just helps us build that growing momentum and demonstrate across industry and on that this is not a good bet, that we should not be drilling in this special place. Um, it also ties I into- I something important there, Ali. It's, you yeah. know, they can really only go in there in, during the winter when the ground is frozen. So if they don't get that winter period, it essentially sets back the clock for like a whole year, right? That's exactly right. Yeah, thank you for clarifying that, Jason. So it's a big win. And we know they're going to reapply for this coming season again. That starts in December. So look for that. We won. It's a big deal. And we're going to want to pick right back up later on this year. But we're laying the groundwork for it. And part of how we're doing that is by continuing to push the momentum that we're seeing from major financial institutions, including banks such as Barclays, that the Gwich'in met with, with our Sierra Club team back in October, which laid the groundwork for Barclays, including a policy that specifically outlined that they do not support drilling in the coastal plain, which is a major step. That's the first bank to come out with that specific of a policy. Uh, and it sends the message to other banks, financial institutions, investors, and these oil companies which we will continue to work with and elevate this risk through the upcoming annual general meeting season that's coming throughout this year. So we're just keeping up the pressure on that, really, again, underscoring the risks to anybody that would invest in this place um, and make sure that they are hearing from folks far and wide. So I'm excited about that work.
Thank you so much, Ali, for that really encouraging and exciting update on all that work. Bernadette, I do want to bring it back to you, but before we do, um, a couple of audience questions. Again, if you're on the Zoom platform, you can drop your question right there into the Q&A. Um, if you're on Facebook, put it in the comments section. But real quick, Chris, a couple of questions um, to know, again, the bill. Um, and also, there was another question about how people can find out whether or not their representative has already sponsored this legislation. You're muted, Chris. Okay, there we go. Hello. Um, sure, sure. So I answered some of those questions in the chat box, but for everybody else, the bill is HR 47, and it's the Arctic Cultural and Coastal Plain Protection Act from um, Congressman Jared Huffman out of California. And one way to um, find out if they co-sponsored is to go to um, a website called congress.gov, a place where you can look up all bills um, that's in Congress right now. Just type in HR 1147. You'll see in, um, there'll be a number of bills that come up from various years. Make sure you're looking at the 116th Congress. Click on that. It'll bring up a page that has all the information about the bill and there that says co-sponsor. Once you look at that tab, you can you can see who co-sponsored, um, what date, and you can also look by uh, state as well. Awesome, thank you so much for that, Chris. It's super, super helpful. So Bernadette, staying on this topic here of the Arctic Cultural and Coastal Plain Protection Act, I'm wondering if you could just share with the audience a little bit what it was like going down to Washington, D.C. and testifying um, before Congress about this legislation. Sure, um, well, we had um, some other, you know, Gwich'in leaders, we all went down. It was really, it was heartfelt just to know that, you know, we still have elected leadership in, um, in Congress that wanna protect um, our lands and that respect our human rights. Um, it was, um, it, it really made my heart feel very happy. I, I it also, um, made me recognize that we still have a lot of work to do. Um, you know, there's always new incoming elected leaders coming in and that to continue to um, what's important to us. And uh, like, we, you know, going down there, we have to, it takes almost one um, whole day. <laughs> and, but it's, it's very important to us that we're willing to do that. And it, it, um, you know, Lawson Hall was very respectful and kind, and I'm so happy that he invited us to, to let us, um, you know, for our voices to be heard and shared. I know um, many times people feel that this is a land issue, our animals, but they also got to remember that, you know, there's um, people that have been here too for thousands of years that we occupy this land together and that um, we also matter in this issue. Thank you so much, Bernadette, for, for sharing that. And I'm really glad you had that opportunity to go to Washington DC and, and speak truth to power there. Um, we're gonna go to audience questions now. I'm just gonna um, field these kind of for whomever wants to grab them. And um, we've got a question here from John and this will be open to any of you who wanna answer this. Just curious, what other groups are working um, with the Sierra Club, with the Gwich and Steering Committee on this issue? I think the question is really trying to get at, like, how big is this coalition to defend the Arctic Refuge and working to defend uh, the human rights of the, of the Gwich and people? I want to thank you, John, for the question. I'm really fortunate to have a very big and very powerful and growing coalition of groups that are um, we partner with groups such as the Wilderness Audubon, Alaska Wilderness League, the Natural Resources Defense Council, Earth Justice, Trustees for Alaska, the list goes on. Um, and I think that we're gonna see that continue to grow, particularly as we're working more with groups such as the Indigenous Environmental Network. Um, I got a question here for you, Bernadette, and also Bernadette, some people have asked that it's hard to hear you, so if possible, if you can turn up the volume on your computer. Um, but I'd love to hear your answer on this, Bernadette. I want to know 
um, why there's, I guess she's not hearing um, more about protecting the refuge as both a cultural heritage site in addition to a wildlife refuge. And Catherine, it seems that the two uh, are intertwined and indivisible. So I wonder if you could talk, Bernadette, about the work that the Gwich'in has done uh, over the years um, to talk about this also as a cultural heritage landscape and uh, in addition to being a wildlife refuge. Um, so it is, it is all interconnected. Um, our identity, our food security, our culture, our tradition is, um, you know, it's all in the, our, our land, our animals, our water, um, and we have to keep all of them healthy. Um, working on, you know, trying to find different ways that we can prevent from moving a refuge into an oil field. We're trying that and we're, um, you know, our legal team is really trying to find options on how we can move forward with that. But this is a cultural genocide. This is, you know, um, you know the, it's just a different way, you know, that they're, um, they're kind of destroying our ways of life, um, our environment, our culture, and it's all inter, yeah, she's 100% right. It's all interconnected, and that's the way also. Thank you, Bernadette. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I just, I, I'm just, I answer that right for her is, I'm not, because I think the question could have went either kind of, you know, two different ways. So I hope I answered it in, to her satisfaction. Yeah, that was I thought it was a powerful answer, and I, I hope that um, uh, people, as they're listening to this, understand that this is an important way to talk about this landscape, who live there. Um, we got here from Sarah, uh, my best friend, it's again a question of uh, the financial angle. Uh, and it says, um, uh, how can people have some fossil fuel or bank holding communicate their preferences or vote issues um, via these shareholder meetings or these shareholder resolutions? Sarah, question, and I'm happy to answer it. So that's great. And for folks who do shares in these companies, that entitles you to actually show up general meetings that they are hosting starting in just one week and going through May. So I would strongly encourage you, if you are able to attend those meetings in person and questions to the full suite board members and other shareholders um, that is covered not only in the room with those folks but also with the media and the analysts that are in that space and raise throughout annual general season. and so having multiple people go about the risks in the refuge helps them see that it's a hot topic helps those companies understand helps set the stage for really really causing that disinterest if the Trump administration should move forward with the lease sale and possibly preventing that from happening. I appreciate that and I would also encourage anybody that needs any support in that to reach out to our team um, and I'm happy to provide that. Provide it, how do they get? Well, you can, yeah, you can email me. Uh, I'm at Allie, A-L-L-I dot, they are B E Y at Sierra Club.org. Awesome. And um, we've got a question here from Sarah, and I think maybe for you or Chris. Um, the question Have there been any environmental or environmental impact statement? Uh, what would happen in the case of oil exploration or also um, a, I guess a pipeline rupture place um, that is, and that's covered with. Um, a good chunk of the year. So what, if anything, has the government done in environmental review or environmental impact statement? To my knowledge, there isn't one. Um, I don't, so there's a couple different um, that they're going, BLM, uh, the herrings that's had, um, we've had input from indigenous and just, you know, people that um, are, those were not, you know, into their, so 
I don't think they're doing any, um, I could, but I haven't seen it. I haven't seen any of our put in any of that either. So um, I'm being overlooked if I am correct. Yeah, and just be back on that a little bit. I'm going to talk a little bit about the hearings earlier this year, but there, the, there was a comment period for the draft environmental which Bernadette was just that closed a little while, and there were a number of different hearings in Alaska and then see the, the interesting thing about these hearings were that initially set up public comments um, like a listening session um, where they basically at you and then you just sat there and listened and if you wanted to you could go in the corner and tell a court reporter to do it then it turns out there was a number of um, hearings where people actually talk and um, they had to have a period or and so they started to and then they realized like actually should make it to have public during the during that time. Um, Bernadette came various folks to the DC hearing and we did have a turnout for that um, time frame maybe add on what's the next that for those that process as well sorry I've been trying to unmute myself yeah so the next thing that we'll are kind of on in that administrative process or at least will be additional public comment periods, but each opportunity, like when they issue the record of decision, for instance, we will flag for a membership that presents another opportunity to visibly push back, where the name of the name in this, again, is using every one of the opportunities to just raise the profile of how people are nationalists. So even if the comment period, um, we're able to actively use our voices to still have a cry around it. Um, well, I really want to thank Ali and Chris and Bernadette um, for taking the time to do this conversation, for sharing all of your insight and wisdom, and for sharing your voice today. Before we close out, I do want to give each of the three of you um, a second to just briefly say one thing that supporters, Sierra Club members, and others who are concerned about this issue um, can do. So what can people do who are uh, committed to protecting the Arctic Wildlife Refuge? What can they do to take action on this issue? Bernadette, why don't we start with you? Um, well, I wanted to say that go to our, our Arctic Refuge and I just want to encourage everybody that we are stronger there, that don't care what color we are, what nationality we are, we're all going to be affected and that we start working together, together for our future generations ones who's going to have to live with the aftermath of we cause. Um, so I just want to encourage everybody to just work together with honesty and truth and, um, you know, put whatever difference we have aside and um, really take this serious because it's very, it's very real. It's a very real fight. And whatever happens in the Arctic is going to happen in your home. So it, we need to start addressing these issues together. Um, thank you, Masit Cha, for having me. Um, and I'm always here to help wherever I'm needed. So thank you. Thank you, Bernadette, for all of your leadership on this issue. Um, Chris and Ali, other thoughts about what people can do to take action to defend uh, the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge and to defend the, the rights of the Gwich'in people? I'm going to take a go at it. I would say call your elected officials. We have the bill, the restore protection that Chris outlined in the um, bill number HR 1146. And I'm about to give you a number, so grab your pen. You can call the Capitol switchboard at 202-224-3121 and ask them to support any legislation that restores protection back to Coastal Plain. If it's your house, then you can ask to support the bill. 46 and if it's your senator you can say that 
legislation is coming and that they should watch for it and they should support it when it comes out. And Chris, words from you? You know, uh, one of the things that I always say is continue to talk about the issues that you care most about with your friends and your neighbors and your family members. Just continue to talk and, because you never know. The one, the one person you talk to is going to talk to people, talk to five more people, and you start to see as well. And that's what we need and we continue as well of support the Gwich'in and for the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge in particular coastal plains. So can you talk about we are here um, to answer questions after the forum and um, yeah so thank you so much. Well thank you to Ali, thank you to Chris, thank you to Bernadette and um, for your time, all of your comments today uh, and sharing your views with us. And thanks to you, our members and supporters who joined us today for this Sierra Forum. We've got other upcoming forums throughout the year. I believe our next one is on later this evening. You can join us. Otherwise, you to find us uh, on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, and online all the time at sierraclub.org. Thanks again for all the work that you do, and go safe.